Good evening, everybody, and welcome to If Oxford, the Science and Ideas Festival. Tonight's event um, is a real treat, and in a moment we will be passing over to our speaker for this evening. Um, but just before we do that, I'd like to introduce you to Natalie Ford. Natalie is the Outreach and Engagement Officer for Endorms. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, as Cathy just said, my name's Natalie. Um, we are part of Endorms, which is the Nuffield Department of uh, Orthopaedics, Rheumatology and Muscular Skeletal Sciences. I am delighted to introduce this evening uh, Laura Coates, um, who will be giving her talk uh, joint work. Anyway, I'm going to hand you over now to Laura. Uh, Lovely. So my name is Laura Coates. I'm an associate professor at the Nuffield Department of Orthopaedics, Rheumatology and Musculoskeletal Sciences. And I'm talking to you tonight a bit about my research, but also particularly about how patient partnership is shaping arthritis research, both in Oxford, but also in national projects. And it's something that's really come to the fore, I think, in recent years, as people have seen the benefit of patient inclusion in research. So for those of you who are wondering what Endorms looks like, you can see here on the left, this is where we are based the, at the Botnar Research Group. And this is on the same site as the Nuffield Orthopaedic Centre over in Headington. We're a department of the um, medical division and we're a department of just over 500 staff and students, mostly postgraduate students. So that, that wouldn't include medical students. Uh, we've got a number of academic research staff professional and support staff, and postgraduate students doing masters and PhDs. And then on the right hand side, you can see me. Uh, this is me, I'm Laura Coates. Um, I'm a researcher, obviously, uh, which is why I'm speaking tonight. Um, I'm also a doctor. Um, you can see here in my full COVID gear um, from earlier this year. Uh, I'm a lecturer, both at uh, in, within the department for postgraduate students and also nationally and internationally um, and I'm also a mum so these are my uh, gorgeous children who are also watching and therefore have to be mentioned. Um, this is Freddie and Hattie uh, and my husband James. So first we're going to start by going back in time uh, and we're going back now to 2006 when I started in studying in rheumatology. And I was up in the University of Leeds at the time, and I started off in a research job when I started my rheumatology training. And I knew I wanted to take advantage of that and do something new in research, but it's very difficult to know where to start, really. And I think we, broadly that we split into two different camps in the research field, although some people cross both. But you get researchers who do proper laboratory science, what we call wet lab work. They're pipetting things, looking at cells, learning more about the diseases that we study, learning about potential treatments, inventing and developing potential treatments. And that's really important because if we don't have them, we don't have any medicine to be doing our medicine with. But I think the other half of research is the much more clinical research. So working directly with patients linking into what we do day to day as NHS consultants, but thinking about how we then translate those science discoveries in the laboratory into changing how we treat people. So things like how do we measure disease activity? There isn't a magic test that tells us how active somebody's arthritis is. We use all sorts of different ways to measure that. We ask patients their opinion. We do a number of questionnaires as to how disease impacts on patients. And obviously it's important that we measure things that matter to patients and matter to clinicians. And I went into medicine to work with patients. I love having that interaction. And one of the brilliant things about rheumatology is we really get to know people over a number of years. Unfortunately, as of yet, we haven't come up with cures for a lot of the types of arthritis that we treat. So we're dealing with a chronic condition, but that means we develop a relationship over a number of years with patients and hopefully get to see them improve on treatment and get back to a normal quality of life whilst we're looking after them. So these, this was my big decision I felt back in 2006. I was offered a project to go into the lab and study a complicated group of cells called inflammasomes. 
And I work with some brilliant researchers in Oxford who do exactly that, who study cells and they get excited about particular types of cells. But if I'm absolutely honest, I don't get excited about cells. I get excited about talking to people. And so I went into clinical research rather than becoming what my boss at the time in Leeds would have called an expensive test tube breaker. And I probably would have been one of those. And it was around that time that I discovered a quote which is used actually quite widely outside the research um, field, but is used now to think about patient involvement in research. Nothing about us without us. So having that involvement of the, the end user, the people who experience this day to day when we're thinking about research. So what do I do? So when I'm asked uh, what I do, for the most part, I say I study psoriatic arthritis. And usually people follow up with, sorry, what? No, psoriasis and arthritis. So most people have heard of psoriasis. It's, it's a skin rash that affects up to 3% of people in the UK and causes these thick red plaques on different parts of the body. And in around a third of people, it's associated with an arthritis that can affect any joint. It can come on at any age uh, and it causes significant disability and impact on the patients. And I'm going to follow now showing you a few photos of patients that I've looked after over the years. So you get an idea of what this disease can look like. So patients have arthritis, it can affect any joint. These happen to be fingers and toes. It can also affect big joints like ankles and knees. And it affects both the joint in the soft tissue in terms of swelling and inflammation, but also the bones underneath. In addition to arthritis, patients get what we call emphysitis, And this is inflammation where a tendon attaches onto the bone. And the most common is around the Achilles tendon because that obviously gets used a lot when we walk day to day, but it can affect a number of different tendon insertions around the body and cause pain around the knees, the elbows or the ankles. And then in a small proportion of patients, we develop something called dactylitis. And this is where you get inflammation in the joint itself, but also in all of the soft tissue and the tendons so that the whole finger or toe swells up with a very uniform swelling all the way down the digit. And when we talk about this in clinic with patients, we often use the analogy of a sausage toe. So the whole thing swells up a little bit like a sausage. And then a proportion of our patients also get inflammation in their spine. So they get pain and stiffness in the spine. They get changes in the bones. You can see here the bones have started to join together a bit more rather than being separate vertebrae. So that really affects how much people can move and do things. So I'm going to talk about three different projects tonight where we've had extensive patient involvement and how we're taking these forward in Oxford, across the UK, and also potentially impacting internationally as well. So the first project is something called a James Lind Priority Setting Partnership. And this is a project that I'm currently leading out of Oxford, but in collaboration with a number of charities. So Brit Pact, which is our research charity, which I chair across the UK, but also patient supporting charities like the Psoriasis Association and PAPA, who are invaluable in giving their support to these kind of projects. And the idea of a priority setting partnership is that we ask patients and normal jobbing clinicians in practice across the country what they think we should be researching. What should our priority be when we're planning what to study? So we do a survey and the first survey just asks everybody who's interested, patients, family members, carers, clinicians, nurses, or everybody to input what they think are the most important questions. We say, what are the top three things that you think we should research? And then we take that forward to a literature review. We check all of the medical literature to try and work out whether these things have already been looked at. And we get some questions that are about service design. They're not really a research question, they're really valuable and they help us think about how we design the service within the NHS, but they're slightly separate, so we keep them separate. 
And then we have research questions that are actually already answered. They're what Trump would call known unknowns. Um, so these are things that people have already researched. We know the answer, but obviously people don't haven't heard. They don't know about that. So what we need to do here is make a list of things that we should teach patients and doctors, nurses and other allied healthcare professionals. And then we have the true unknown unknowns. These are the real research questions that we should be focusing on moving forward. So they're the true uncertainties. And we take these and we put them into a second survey. And this time we ask the same patients, carers, clinicians, anybody who's interested to rank these and say, what do you think is the most important? Not just a list of questions, but putting them into priority order. And then we take that order from the second survey, we run a final workshop, and we come up with the top 10 priorities that researchers should be looking at. And we are currently running this for psoriatic arthritis. It's the first one that's run in rheumatology in any of the different topics, but there have been a number run in orthopedics and run in Oxford before. And at the moment, we're just here. So we've done our first survey, we've collected over a thousand different questions, which we're now grouping and categorizing before we go forward to check whether they've been answered already. And these are the kind of things that we've had submitted. So these are some of the questions, some of that thousand that we've had sent in to us. And you can see here that they really vary. They cover an awful lot of different aspects of the disease. So things about treatment, but also about how to get diagnosis, how we think about not just the arthritis, but other associated things like fatigue. How can patients help themselves? So what can we tell them about diet or alcohol or smoking or other lifestyle factors? And things about why people get psoriatic arthritis. Is it hereditary? Are my children going to get it because I've had it? And how do we support and look after people best? So we're now moving forward and we'll be doing that second survey early next year to get people to rank these in order. And we're lucky doing this for psoriatic arthritis because we're following behind a group who've already done it just for the psoriasis fit, the skin condition. And that was published a couple of years ago and they already have their top 10. That was led by the Psoriasis Association. What I'm showing you here is the top four of that top 10. So you can see here key questions that came out of the workshop as the main priority for people moving forwards. But I think what's interesting and maybe not surprising is that how we rank things is very different when we think about clinicians, healthcare workers versus the patients and their carers. So you can see here that that first question about lifestyle factors was ranked highly by both clinicians and patients. And so that's ended up as number one after the final workshop. The second and third question were ranked really highly by the clinicians, but much, much lower by the patients. So if we treat early, can we change the outcome for the disease? And what factors predict how well people respond to treatment? And that's something everybody I think feels is important, but maybe from the clinician point of view, we really feel that day to day in clinic, we'd love to know how to pick the best drug for the best patient in front of us. And then you can see on question four, this question ranked much, much lower from the healthcare professionals, but much higher from the patients. And that's because I think we're thinking about the inflammation and affecting the immune system using our powerful medications to do that. But actually patients are living with these symptoms day to day. They're living with itching and scaling and flaky skin. And so that's something which affects them much more day to day and clearly that they feel is more of a priority. And also it's a key priority for people with quite mild psoriasis that actually we never see. They may never get onto our strong immune medications, but they well, may well need simple input of how to manage their skin. So we're now moving forward for, towards that top 10 and we're hoping to get that complete in 2021. So there'll be more surveys coming round, um, trying to get people to rank the questions that we've had in so far. And the idea then is that if you have a top 10 like this, 
It obviously can influence researchers. We know whether um, questions we have are considered important or if we're just looking for ideas, we can come to these questions and think more about it. And also funding bodies can look at this. So if it's a charity, a government, um, or a particular group giving out funding, they can say, well, does this matter to people? Is this important? And the Psoriasis Association themselves, as well as sponsoring this project, do fund research projects. So the recent rounds that they've opened this year, they now have a specific question which they ask researchers to say, how does this relate to the top 10? So it's really helping focus the research where it's needed. The second project I'm gonna talk about is a project running here in Oxford, um, as well as at other centers across the UK. And this is a cohort study looking at patients diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis. It's an observational study and we ask people to join this cohort to have their treatment as usual on the NHS, but for us to collect information when they come to clinic to find out if we can predict who will respond to different therapies, who will do well or who will struggle. So we treat people as normal with one arthritis drug. If that doesn't work, we give them another arthritis drug. If that doesn't work, we give them a newer type of drug called a biologic drug. And this is very much based on the standard NHS approach, but we're thinking about what matters to patients within this study. So we worked with patient partners to decide what we should measure. So things like the impact of the disease, how does it affect you in terms of pain, your ability to work, your ability to fulfill normal social activities, if it wasn't COVID and people had normal social activities. But the other problem with this study is that really, as in clinical practice at the moment, we're kind of treating everybody the same. Um, and we know that that's not the case, uh, not just as no one is the same, particularly patients with psoriatic arthritis have really big differences in the way their disease presents. In those different pictures that I showed you earlier, which joints are involved, how many joints, are the tendons involved? Is the spine involved? Is their skin very mild and just a little bit flaky? Or is it very severe and impactful on them? And so the other idea within this cohort is that we can embed different trials. So when we're thinking about those other researchers who are toiling away in the lab with their cells, developing new drugs, this is where we can potentially test them. So we can take patients who are newly diagnosed and instead of giving them the normal drug, we can give them something new and see if it's better. And we can do that at any point. So we can do it after they fail a first drug, we could try a new one, after they fail a second drug, or even after they fail all of our initial treatments. So we can think about different treatments for different people. So I'm gonna talk about one of those studies which was run here in Oxford and also in Bath within that cohort. So I want you to imagine a patient with psoriatic arthritis and this particular patient has quite mild disease. Um, so he has one swollen knee, which you can see here, and he has a bit of tenderness around the elbow where the tendon inserts around that joint. But actually it doesn't bother him hugely day to day. It flares up now and then, but it's not the biggest deal. He's managing. So our standard treatment would be to give him these arthritis drugs. And they're tablets that you take every week, every day, twice a day. And so they're quite a commitment for him to have to be taking. And not only that, but they re require regular blood monitoring. Initially more frequently, it spaces out with time, but it's an additional hassle and an additional factor to weigh up as to whether he wants to take these drugs. The alternative is to think a bit simpler. So can we give him an injection into that swollen knee to settle it down? That might give him a good period of time with that under control. And he can just use simple painkillers like ibuprofen around that. And we can avoid him having to take tablets, the side effects of those tablets, the cost of the tablets, and the hassle and cost of the blood results. So this study is called the POISE study. Um, and this, at this time, we're taking out patients right from the beginning when they're first diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis, 
and we're offering them this symptomatic treatment instead of the normal medications. And we spent a long time designing this with patients so that it would make sense to them and so that they would find it acceptable. We don't want to offer things that patients don't want to do. So we designed this really carefully with patients and we said, well, we could give them an injection into the joint, but how long would you wait? How long, how often is it reasonable to have an injection? Or when would you rather just take tablets? So we talked to a number of different patients and they said, well, maybe if you needed more than two injections in a six month period, then maybe we should just go back onto the tablets. But before that, we could try just with the injections and see if that's enough to control disease. So we designed this really carefully. We spoke to a lot of patients to set this up and we opened the study. And what we wanted to do was recruit 30 patients who would have the injections and the painkillers and 30 tablets who would take 30 people who would take the usual tablets as part of our standard care. And we were open for recruitment for about 15 months, so through to July this year. And we were aiming to recruit these 60 patients from the hospital here in Oxford and also in Bath. And over that 15 month period, I'm excited to announce that we managed to recruit one. And this is what I looked like in July um, when we added up the number of patients that we had recruited in this trial. And what we learned is something really important, but potentially actually not surprising with hindsight. And that's that representation matters. We designed this study really, really carefully with patients who had psoriatic arthritis, who help us to design studies, and for the most part, tend to have more severe disease and be on those regular medications. And so that's normal for them. What we found was when we went to recruit these patients with milder disease, who've only just been diagnosed, that actually they were happy to have the knee injection, they were happy to take the painkillers, what they didn't want was the standard treatment. So we put all this effort into designing the new intervention, but actually they wanted that anyway. They didn't want to take the tablets and have all the regular blood tests. So what this means is that uh, although we asked an awful lot of patients, we didn't ask the right patients. We didn't ask patients early on in their disease with milder disease. And so what we need to do is be asking patients who have all sorts of different experiences, different types of disease, different duration of disease, who also represent different areas of our community. Because unless we have a diverse group, we're not going to be able to predict these problems ahead of time. And so that brings us back to nothing about us without us. Right, that first quote that, um, that I mentioned right at the beginning in terms of patient involvement. And it also brings me to my third project to speak about tonight. So what we want to do here in Oxford at Endorms, at the Botnar Centre, um, also in association with the Kennedy, is develop a large patient and public group who will help us input into trials. And we're looking for a group of people in Oxford who would be interested in hearing more about research projects. We're aiming to run talks a little bit like this one, but a little bit more interactive, hopefully, particularly when we manage to get back face to face, to talk about ideas that we have, to talk about research projects and get input into those at a very early stage. We're also looking to develop a committee who will help us lead that. And the aim is to have equal representation from patients and from researchers here at Endorms. So we have a group of researchers in place who represent all the different bits of research that we do at Endorms, lab scientists, clinical researchers, physiotherapists, orthopedic surgeons, rheumatologists. We have two amazing patients to date who have given an amazing amount of support and time. Um, Barbara and Jenny, and we're now looking to recruit an additional small group of patients who would like to help with that committee, ideally from a diverse perspective, different diseases, different experiences, 
different sorts of people from across Oxfordshire. And now our aim is to have patient and public involvement into everything that we do. So thinking very initially at the first stage, if we're pitching a research idea, does this question matter? Do patients care? Is it gonna change their lives? And any initial thoughts that people have about that first proposal. And then secondly, if we're starting to develop a project, what are the interventions that we're offering? Just like you saw in that last study, does that sound reasonable? Do you think people would want to do these things? And are we measuring the right things? Are we measuring what matters to patients at the end of the day? If their joints get slightly less red, do they care? What matters is pain, their function, their ability to do things, to work, to have a life. Um, and so thinking about the kind of things we measure in studies is really important. And then finally, at the other end, when we've got results, what we want to do is share them with you. Again, at a really early stage, but to show some brief results and say, what does this mean to you? Does it make sense? And how do we share this information with other patients? So my final um, slides are really about a call to arms to join us. Um, we are setting up the Open Arms Group. That's the Oxford Patient Engagement Network in Arthritis and Musculoskeletal Sciences. We're asking people to share their experiences, to tell us what you think about these research ideas, new treatments, new investigations, to prioritise our research and help to engage the public with the results when we have them. So I'm going to finish um, before any questions by acknowledging um, that the study I presented in the middle, the one that didn't do too well, um, was funded by the National Institute for Health Research. That cohort is ongoing and has other studies um, running at the moment. Um, the, the charities who've supported this work, BritPact, which I chair, but also the Psoriasis Association and PAPA, who are both amazing patient support charities who help us with an awful lot of how we care for our patients with psoriatic arthritis and the clinical trials research unit who support our studies. So if you're interested um, in this project in giving back and hearing more about what we do at the Botnar Centre, then you are very welcome to sign up for more information about open arms meetings and events. Obviously for now, these will all be online, but in the future, we hope to make you a very good cup of tea or coffee. Um, and we have a website available, which will I think be emailed out um, after this talk as well. So you can sign up if you're interested, send us an email now, and we can contact you with further information in the future. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Laura. Uh, that was amazing. Um, there's still a chance for people to ask questions. So there is a Q&A section, depending on how exactly you're consuming this. Um, if you're on a desktop, for instance, that you'll see that under the screen, there's a bit that says Q&A. If you click on that, you can type questions. There's still time for a few more to come in um, now. Um, for the time being, though, Laura, um, we were wondering, we've got a question. Um, if you do decide to get involved, what kind of commitment is that? So I think it's whatever people would like to do um, moving forward. So we want to have regular meetings a bit like this. So there will be Zoom meetings to start with where, where researchers can present their questions, present their initial data and get some feedback. So they will be monthly, but obviously you don't have to commit every month. Um, it's flexible. Um, we are also looking at the other end of the scale to pe for people to join our amazing existing patient um, partners uh, within the committee and really help to shape what we do and help design what we do in the future in terms of engaging patients. So I think there's something for everybody depending on how keen you are um, and how much time you have to give, but we'd really benefit greatly from having that help. Um and so um, another question, um, what have, have you um, had any research that has been changed by things that patients have done or said? And if, we, if someone got involved now, when would you expect to see any changes sort of feeding through as a result? So I think, again, that's really variable. So we clearly, when we're designing studies, 
change things immediately based on patient feedback. We change what kind of things we're including, exactly what the question looks like, what the outcome measures look like for the study. So there's definitely some things that impact immediately. The people who are taking part in studies, there are some studies that are much more at the clinical end where we can see an impact really quickly. Um, so things like the priority setting partnership will impact funding hopefully very soon. Um, if we're looking at something simple like developing a new questionnaire that people can use, then we can get that out into clinics within a year or so and get people using that. At the other end of the spectrum, particularly I think more for the lab stuff, if you're giving blood, if you're giving additional samples, bits of tissue, um, when you're having operations and things like that, that goes into amazing basic science research in the lab. And that may take many years before it develops into a new treatment, a new test, um, but that will feed into changing people's treatment many years in the future. Okay. Um, oh, right. Okay. Uh, what's your favorite thing about your job? Ooh. Um, I think, I think working with patients, particularly over a long period of time. So I think I, I love the fact that rheumatology, you really get to know people, you develop a relationship and hopefully see those patients get better. That, that's why we go to work. That's, that's why we do what we do. So diagnosing people in a really difficult period of their lives when they've got something that they never expected completely out of the blue, which is often massively impacting them, their lives, but getting them on the right treatment and getting them well back to work, back to life, back to normal um, day to day things. Uh, and someone's just asked, are you interested in hearing from patients with long standing serious psoriasis, but not um, psoriatic arthritis? Yeah, so obviously psoriasis is really part of it. It's a massive part of how we treat people with psoriatic arthritis. We work really closely with the dermatologists to give people the best treatment. And we know that we can't just treat somebody's joints or somebody's skin, we've got to treat the patient, the person in front of us and how that disease as a whole impacts on them. Um, so we, we certainly have a number of questions in our priority setting partnership that are around the psoriasis side of things. And also for those people with psoriasis, how do you know who's going to get arthritis? Um, you know, can we, can we intervene early? Can we pre prevent people getting arthritis? Um, so I think there are a lot of ideas about that transition from psoriasis to psoriatic arthritis, and that's the focus of a big European project, which we're hoping will start next year. We'll be looking for 25,000 people across Europe with psoriasis to follow and see if they develop psoriatic arthritis. Uh, thanks very much for that, Laura. I, I guess, so there isn't a particular age associated with um, getting uh, psoriatic arthritis then or anything? No, so it's it's basically any age. So um, we do have children who develop psoriatic arthritis. We then call it juvenile arthritis, but there's there's a psoriatic group. I don't personally look after them. They would come under pediatricians, um, but I look after people from 18 to 90. I've had patients who present at 18 or have even had it from childhood and then come to me. And I have patients, including actually a couple of the pictures in this presentation, um, were from a lady who presented in her 80s with new psoriasis and new psoriatic arthritis. And she'd never developed those, um, you know, for 80 years of her life. She clearly was born with the genes, um, but they didn't do anything <laughs> until she got into her 80s. And then she suddenly developed that. Wow. Um, well, um, I'd just uh, like to thank you again, uh, Laura, for that. Um, I don't think we've got any more unanswered questions at the moment um, if anything occurs to you later Kathy will be sending uh, around you can sign up as an interested patient um, or you can um, just contact us uh, later um, if you're interested through the form on the website um, but for now um, I'd just like to thank uh, Laura very much um, for her time for the talk. It's very interesting. I've certainly learned something new. And I'm going to hand you back to Kathy, who's going to tell you a bit more about the festival. Thank you, Natalie. And thank you so much, Laura, for such an interesting presentation. I've certainly learned a lot today. 
Um, so tonight's presentation was part of a series um, offered to us by NIHR, which is the National Institute for Health Research, and the series is called Health Research and You. We've got one more talk left in this series, which is tomorrow evening at 6 p.m., and it's quite topical. It's been in the news this week. It's about pelvic pain and diagnosing endometriosis sooner. Um, so if you're interested in that, do sign up for that on the website, if-oxford.com. Um, but really, it just leaves me to thank Laura and Natalie again for this evening uh, and to hope that we see you again soon at one of our other events. So good night for now and see you again. <laughs>